recording. Hi there, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are very excited about tonight's presentation with Gary. He is our uh, rodenticide expert that we have done a couple, one other presentation with. So we're very excited about tonight. I want to thank you all for joining us. This is an extremely important um, subject and we are very, very excited to give everyone a little extra education. Before I hand things over to Gary, I'm just gonna remind everyone, my name is Rebecca. I am the Director of Outreach Marketing and Events and also the Volunteer Coordinator at Wild Care. And I have to remind you that every $5 actually does help us save a life. So everyone that donated for tonight's presentation thank you so much because it actually does go it is baby season for us at wild care and honestly every five dollars literally does matter even more this time of year so as excited as we are to see all of those cute babies it is an inordinate amount of mouths to feed so thank you so much for your support and your donations for those of you that don't know a lot about wild care or would like to make an additional donation, you can always donate and find some descriptions about us on our Facebook page, or you can log on to wildcarecapecod.org. We have a nice big donate now or, vo or volunteer now button right at the top of the page. Um, if you'd rather give us your hours than your dollars, um, we can put you on the waiting list to be in uh, a volunteer later this year. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Gary. Um, just one quick reminder for those of you that have questions, you can type them in the chat function, and I'll be fielding those to Gary at the end. But if you would keep yourselves on mute, we would appreciate it. So Gary, it is all yours. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me tonight. I appreciate this opportunity to uh, to spread the word about rodenticides. And the key word is awareness. And this, this whole program really is going to be around about awareness. Um, I modified the program slightly from last time because we've had a major development since the last time I spoke. And that is relative to House docket number 4206, which is a, a bill which is sponsored by Representative Jim Hawkins out of Attleboro. And it's specifically for that, for awareness of the devastation that's caused by rodenticides. A little bit about my background here. I was an environmental compliance manager for GE for a number of years. I'm currently on the Board of Health, town of Sterling. I've been so for the last decade or so. And I'm pretty much now kind of assumed a self-assumed a position of a de facto environmentalist where I advocate for any and all activities that promote poison alternatives in our environment. At the bottom of the screen, you see my email address there. Give you a minute, please, if you'd like to copy it down and my phone number to let you know if you should send me an email, my intent is to answer all of them. And so if for whatever reason you send me one and I don't answer it, by all means, give me a call because it was not intentional. It might've gone to my spam folder or some such thing. And uh, I just want to make sure you know that, so I'm not ignoring you. <clears throat> okay, we'll get started. And I'm going to start with something you probably not heard in an awful long time. Once upon a time, once upon a time, my brother and I, uh, when I was 10 years old, on my paper route, I, we discovered an unfortunate situation, but it, you know, proved to be fortuitous for me, where we we actually found a great horned owl that had been hit by a car, and I'd never had seen or heard of such a such a creature and i was i was just enthralled by it it looked rather prehistoric with these one inch one and a half inch long talons on it it just was uh, was amazing to me and that it, it kind of compelled me to read my first book and write my first book report on this book the, the uh, cover which is in the center bubo the great horned owl um this is a book for you know an adolescent audience um i read it cover to cover and from that point forward became en enthralled with with all things raptors. This uh, book instantly was uh, written by Gene Craighead George, who also wrote My Side of the Mountain, which is attributed by a number of environmentalists is getting them started in the field of environmental consciousness. And it's still available in print today. Anyways, <clears throat> that uh, that has fostered a you know, an interest in, in raptors from that day forward, whether it be the great horned owls or the eagles or the hawks or the falcons. And coincidentally in 2018, you'll see why it's a coincidence because uh, National Geographic had dedicated that year to the birds. And, uh, and that same year, as I was reading through that article, I had occasion to go to my daughter's house because I was, I was fairly newly retired and I was uh, drafted, if you will, to uh, because my wife hadn't retired and my son-in-law 
of course, hadn't retired and my daughter was still working to to watch over my grandchildren and my grand dogs and my grand cat. I was over their house one day and I noticed a box of uh, decon. This is this is the box that I that I noticed there. And uh, I was I was bothered by that, especially bothered. And I didn't really know why, <laughs> but I was concerned that, you know, the children would get into this. And I was sitting there on the floor, and the 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 irony was that my my daughter and son-in-law are very, you know, 100% organic. If I should take the kids out to McDonald's, and heaven forbid, get them a, an order of French fries, they would, I would never hear the end of it because they were made with trans fats or some such thing. And uh, I, I, I pointed this out to them. You can't be doing this. You can't have this box in your house. This is posing a danger, I believe, to your children and to your pets. And in the back of my mind was uh, Boobo the Great Horned Owl that, that that's going to somehow affect him as well. So uh, I just started doing some research. And son of a gun, it, it is a significant risk to children. And one of the reasons why it's a big risk to children is that these these rodents, if they should get into your house, and mice will invariably get into your house. They they collect the the um, the pellets, the rodenticide pellets, and they'll store them in places. They won't necessarily eat them immediately. They'll store them. They can store them in a child's shoe, or, or basically anywhere. And then a child can get a hold of it. You know, they're of attractive color. They're bright colors. They may have a scent or a flavor that attracts rodents. Will also attract the children. So they're dangerous for children, and that reason alone should, you know should reason enough that you shouldn't be using them, especially with young children in the house. And of course your pets, the pets will of course get into them. And it, it is a serious issue for pets. I and uh, we had a neighborhood dog here. Our, our first dog we had here in Sterling was a neighborhood dog. And it basically would roam the neighborhood. And one day it came back with a box of decon. I became very concerned about that. Had to go through the process of iopectate and getting the dog to, to uh, to um, basically vomit the, the rodenticides, but fortunately I didn't see anything and she re, she never had any ill effects and apparently hadn't eaten anything. But um, pets are certainly affected. It's one of the largest calls. It's to um, pet control or poison control centers. And it's regularly one of the top 10 pet toxins every year. But then I came across this article. And if anybody wants a reason to be committed to the to this process of of being an anti-rodenticider is just read this article. You can Google it, you know, just Google Audubon February, 2013 and Professor Maureen Murray and read that article. And I'll read just a couple of paragraphs here. It um, was written by uh, an author by the name of Ted Williams, not the base, late baseball player, but another Ted Williams who was an environmental writer. And he went on to, uh, to describe the reactions from Dr. Maureen Murray as she was going through the photographs of her necropsies or autopsies of, of hawks and owls that have been had been poisoned. And she was doing a good job of keeping her emotions under wraps as she clicked through these photos of dead hawks and owls. But as I was watching her eyes, as well as her computer screen, they revealed the anguish. And that's what you're going to see right now, the red-tailed hawk with a ballooned eye caused by the, the anticoagulant rodenticides, the internal bleeding, the great horned owl with a hematoma running the length of its wing, wing. and the, the saddest of all, a red-tailed female with the well-developed blood vessels in her oviducts had ruptured and she slowly bled, bled to death from the inside. There were many other images. Each image was sadder than the last. Each one, you know, when they dissected these animals, there's pools of, of uncoagulated blood beneath their, beneath their feathers, beneath their skin. And these anticoagulants are used by exterminators, farmers, you go to Home Depot or Mackey's. Uh, in fact, I was at Mackey's the other day, I was trying to get a few more snap traps. They don't even sell them anymore. Or at least they didn't that day, they were out of stock. I'm not even sure they're gonna restock them. All they had was poisons. And it got me, it continued my, my anguish, if you will. Now, if you do a search, you know, and, and hawks, owls, rats, and poisons, you can kind of come up with many tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of hits. One time I came up with a million hits. I'm not sure what I did differently that day, but it was uh, over a million hits. And some of the statistics going back a few years between 2006 and 2010, 
at the Tufts Wildlife Center, probably done by Maureen Murray, 87, 86% had poison residues in their liver. That's what you, what they, 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 uh, they biopsy is the liver. And that's where the poisons will accumulate. And that's where it'll be tried to be ex excreted from the body. And then from 2012 to 2017, 94 rap Massachusetts raptors, hawks and owls, had 96% of them had detectable poisons. And this data, the next bullet was from Norman Smith. Some of you may know Norman Smith. He's, he's quite uh, famous in the environmental word, word, world for his work with snowy owls at Logan Airport. He's been featured in many newspapers and magazines. But in the year 2017, 2018, that winter, which was a significant winter and a significant you know, incursion from snowy owls, these beautiful, beautiful birds. I've never seen one in the wild actually. And nine of them had died from rodenticide poison. These snowy owls would hang out at the Logan airport during the day. And then at night they would, they would go to the um, restaurants in Boston, hang out on the dumpsters and what are around the dumpsters, but rats and rodenticides. So it's really, you know, heart rendering to have that kind of statistics. And of course, there's there's other stats. As I say, if you do do that search, you'll come up with many more than that. But one of the interesting things that Maureen, Dr. Murray had told me was they haven't seen a single great horned owl or red tail hawk that they have autopsy. They don't autopsy them all because the uh, the analysis does cost a few bucks. I think it's on the order that costs them on the order of forty bucks to have it a biopsy for for rodenticides. But every single one that they've done that they've had necropsy have proven to be a contained poison in their livers. So it's, you know, it's ubiquitous, it's all over the place. Now, <clears throat> these poisons, especially what the poisons we're most concerned about right now are these anticoagulants. These were discovered, you know, actually as a, as a byproduct of spoiled sweet clover hay discovered by farmers. It was causing hemorrhaging in the cattle that were eating the, the hay. Now, one thing that came out of this was, was the drug warfarin. And if anybody knows about warfarin, it's a blood thinner. It's used for people that have cardiovascular issues where they need a blood thinner, a stronger blood thinner than ordinary aspirin, say, for example. And actually, what that's what happens is they use this, this, this super warfarin, these anticoagulants, known as second generation anticoagulants. In the lower left-hand corner of the screen, you see SGAR. You'll often see it referred to as SGARs. And those are the most potent anticoagulants. And uh, uh, there's many forms of them. They'll have them in, in these bait boxes. I have a bait box, I don't know if you can see that. I have a bait box here that I'm trying to show you. Um, if you go to restaurants, just about anywhere, you look around the parking lot or near the dumpster, you'll see one of these bait boxes around and you know that they're using poison, typically. And these are the main poisons here, these second generation anticoagulants. And you know, I looked at this box that I have in front of me here that I found at my daughter's house. And there's a lot of confusion about this. People will say, oh, the, the S-jars have been banned. And yet this has an S-jar in it. And this, this was bought at Home Depot. So I don't know what they're talking about um, because it does have diphanicone here at the bottom one. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, but it's right on the box. So that's a little bit confusing. Now. There are the first generation anticoagulants. And the reason they've gone from first generation to second generation is the first generation, the rodents were building a resistance to it. So they wanted something stronger. And there's also non-anticoagulants and that's not gonna be the uh, subject of our discussion tonight specifically, but it, we're basically, we're against all kinds of poisons, if you will. None of these poisons are any good. And whether they're anticoagulants or you know affecting the nervous system, to me, it doesn't matter so much. In each case, what, no matter which kind you use, it's, it causes non-target organism poisoning, i.e. the raptor that eats the poison rodent. Now, as I said, that this is a bit confusing because the, there's a myth out there that these second generation anticoagulants have been banned. And I just showed you that it did deep box decon, unless I'm reading things wrong, there's one in this commercially available decon box. Maybe that was old stock, I don't know. Um, but uh, that myth was extrapolated to say, okay, it, they weren't banned. What was banned was uh, um, amounts in excess of one pound. So I went on Amazon and I 
ordered some Havoc. And Havoc has that Bromathon in it. Um, if I go back that, I'll tell you which one it is if I previous slide here. It has Brodificum in it, which is the main anticoagulant, rodenticides. And so I just tested the system. I, I went on Amazon. I have an Amazon Prime account and I ordered a bag of this, eight pound bag. And it came through <laughs> like overnight. It was not a problem. And then they say, you know, they said that uh, the EPA, they were kind of bragging about it. the DPA rule in 2008, basically banned them to the consumers. Well, I'm a consumer and I can go on Amazon and, and have it here tomorrow. So some of these laws that, that they say are out there are meaningless. And that's what we're trying to fight as well. And now I, I decided to do a customer review on this Amazon product. And I, I put on there, the, as you look in the center of the screen there, these poisons kill unintended wildlife. And uh, I go on to say, you know, basically a, a little statistic there for them. And as a result of that, I, I rated them one star because you can't give them zero stars. And next thing I know, they could not post it for me because they didn't want to post it. <laughs> they don't want this kind of negative advertising out there. But uh, I, I tried. Okay. So how do these, I think you pretty much already know how they work, you know. You set the bait out there, whether it's in one of these you know, bait boxes like shown you know, in the lower left hand, right hand corner of your screen or the one I have in front of me here now. Um, this one's empty. I, I haven't loaded it. I don't have any intention to load it. I'm just using, using it for a show and tell. Um, and the rodent eat and eats the bait. The rodent, the bait makes the rodent very thirsty. The weakened rat seeks water outside typically. It becomes an easy target for a predator because it's moving rather slow. And then the, the predator eats the rodent and it's the one that get po gets poisoned as well, as we've shown in those previous slides. So when you go to, um, go to any restaurant in your area, take a look at this. Take a look at the, the, the around near the dumpsters and around where the park people park the car up against the curbs. And you may see a few of these. And if anybody here on the, um, in the audience would like to do a bait box survey there is a process by which bait box surveys can be done, which is sponsored by a group called Raptors Are the Solution out in California. They have a whole tool toolkit on how to do this with the, in with the intent of you taking this survey and bringing it to maybe a boards of health and trying to convince these people to use other methods. Now, <clears throat> this goes back a couple of years. And this, this article, which I think was in uh, one of the local papers there, indicated that a bald eagle had died of rodenticide. And I'm putting a big question marks there and you'll find out later because I haven't been able to really substantiate this story other than articles like this. When you talk to mass wildlife, they do not substantiate it. How, so why did the bald eagle die? I do not know, but they, they're in Barnstable attributed to, to rat poison. However, we do know that red tail hawks, great horned owls and all the other raptors that are frequent here in New England can be subject to these poisons and are dying from it. And that's not limited to raptors, of course, foxes and skunks and raccoons and bobcats, they also are affected by these rodenticides. So from Cape Cod to Cape Gann and everywhere in between and out west to, uh, to Berkshire County, where I was born and raised and beyond across the country, these rodenticides are a big problem. And um, as a kind of an aside topic, um, there, which, is, which seems rather strange to me, but with the advent of legalization of recreational marijuana, there are organizations, there are groups, illegal groups, which are trying to make synthetic marijuana to get it mixed into the market. And, one of the things they do with synthetic marijuana is actually add rodenticides to provide for a greater hit, if you will. Seems rather crazy to me, but in fact, they do it. But that's kind of an aside and not the focus of our talk today. You know, so where are we heading in this? Well, you know, we're, we're kind of facing an, an extinction crisis in the United States and in the world, if you will. And, you know, that we've, uh, we're destroying our wildlife at an incredible rate. You know, we are, what could, what could we do about the last male white rhino? We're kind of powerless. We can donate 
to these organizations like National Wildlife Federation and organizations that, that, that are out of Africa and, and places alike. And hopefully they can take action. But you know, what can we do here? You know, I'm concerned about rap raptors. I'm also concerned about my grandchildren, not necessarily because they may eat rodenticide, though that is a concern. My concern is are they gonna have any raptors left for them to see when they get to my age or before? And there's a, there was a study by this group here that basically said that 52%, greater than 50% of the world's birds of prey populations are in decline. And they're, so they're more threatened than all birds as a whole. And you know, that's kind of stunning, if you will. And it's a big problem internationally. As big, as it, big of a problem as it is here in the States, it's even worse, far worse internationally. So these, uh, these threats are very real. And there's many threats that, that uh, our raptors have to survive throughout their first year, second year, third year of life, whether it be power lines or automotive collisions or window collisions or, or, or in individuals just shooting them, which, uh, which I find abhorrent, trapping barbed wire, even soccer nets and wood turbines can kill these birds of prey. But what, so what can we do about it? We as individuals, well, we can stop using rat poison. And my low bar for success tonight, um, maybe I have a very friendly audience, I guess I probably can presume I do, but at other talks that I've given, you know, people are out there still using rodenticides. And I've had people approach me after the presentation saying, you know, Gary, I had just gone to Home Depot last weekend and stocked up on Undecon. And I'm going to take it back because of your talk. So I felt that talk was a success. And, and that's what I'm trying to do, raise awareness. So the individuals like you and I and families and businesses will stop using these. And if they stop using them, they'll stop producing them. You know, the other thing about these rodenticides is, you know, <clears throat> as I said, the, the raptors, they may produce a clutch of two owls per year if they're lucky, and only one of them is lucky to survive in their first year. But rats, they proliferate, you know, exponentially. You know, about 1,200 in one year from one couple, if you will, can, can be generated. So which species is more likely to develop an immunity? Of course, it's the rodents. It's not the owls and the hawks. So anyways, after I did all this research and I decided I was gonna, I was gonna do something more about it. I started writing articles, letters to the editor, LTEs, and many of these letters to the editors ended up as editorials. And I was very heartened by that. And I got a lot of good feedback about that. In fact, I was approached by the group Raptors Are the Solution to start doing talks on this. And you know, I still advocate for any organization. I've done talks for, for them. I've done talks for Eastern Hawk Watch. I've done talk for Audubon um, at their center out uh, at the Blue Hills. And I'll do it for anybody. And in fact, I'm willing to share my presentation with anybody if anybody in the audience would like to do it on their own. Again, it's about saving these birds. It's about, it's about minimizing the use of these rodenticides. And I'm not concerned about you know, the credit or, or, the, or that sort of thing. I'm concerned about getting these things off the market. Um, again, the key is, awareness. And this is, the, this is the organization, which is a great organization, raptorsarethesolution.org. They have a wealth of materials on there, all of it, which is free, pamphlets, brochures. Um, uh, I can show you, I'll be showing you some of the stuff they have uh, in this presentation. And you're all welcome to go. It's, it's a, you know, a public site. And they've been working very hard on this effort for since 2011. They finally have gotten a bill passed there in California to put a moratorium, mor moratorium on second generation rodenticides. A bit stronger than the bill we'll be talking about here, but um, hopefully we'll be able to follow suit uh, sh shortly. So me too, I was kind of embarrassed. I thought I, I, thought I was a, you know, an environmentalist and I thought that uh, Rachel, was it Rachel Carson had taken, taken care of all this. I thought that uh, the, the book Silent Spring, you know, had, had addressed the issues of poisons in the environment. So how naive could I be? Um, and I was, I was a bit appalled and, and embarrassed at the same time that I discovered this at such a late age. So, you know, we didn't save the right rhino, but we can save our raptors. 
um, this particular in the upper right hand corner is a brood of red tailed hawks that was poisoned. These are young fledglings in Berkshire County in my hometown of Pittsfield, Massachusetts that was poisoned. So you all out there can write letters to your legislators, to your, your publications, you can post your interest on Facebook or any other social media. Um, you can do presentations or you could invite me to do a presentation. You can donate to this Raptors Other Solution organization and they put their money right into to this awareness campaign. And you may have seen um, or may not have seen, we've only had two billboards up in the state um, that they've sponsored. We had one on 128 North um, in um, Peabody. We had one down there in Fall River as well on 95. And, and finally here, this house stock at 4206 is front and center now. And you can choose to support that and if you've got my email address and you'd like a link to any of our conference calls, if you have ideas and you'd like to, you'd like to call in or Zoom in, you're more than welcome to come in and share your ideas. And uh, you have my email, excuse me, you have my email to do that. And the next conference call will be next week and I can send you the link. Um, I actually tried to uh, put this on the 2020 ballot, but uh, it's a very excruciating process. You need 60,000 signatures. I drew up a, you know, an actual uh, uh, article for the ballot. I sent it to the attorney general's office. They sent it back to me. They said, in order for you to get this on the ballot, we, you actually have to go through the regulations, the code of Massachusetts regulations and the Massachusetts general law. And you have to specify everywhere this, this um, ballot will affect these regulations. You have to basically revise the regulations, then return that into the attorney general's office by a certain date. And they've got the next number of days to, to return it to you and approve it or not approve it. Once they approve it, then you've got the remainder of that year, typically only a few months to get some 60,000 signatures statewide, which was pretty much undoable for me as an individual. So I, I kind of, drop that idea but if anybody out there th thinks that's a better idea by all means i'd be happy to support it um okay but beyond this what can we do of course we can stop using poison and that's it goes for you or issued you hire a pest control company the pest control company is you is your customer and you can tell them that you don't want them to use poisons it might affect their price because not using poisons may make it more um, manpower, person power intensive, because you may have to come and rebate traps and clear traps and get rid of the dead rodents and that sort of thing. Um, but it's something you can do. I've done a survey of a dozen exterminators in, in my area here to Wachusett region in central Massachusetts. And of that dozen, three of them agreed to service my account if I had one without using rodenticides. Now notice this, this is a red tail hawk, which is featured in the center screen there. You take a look, that red tail hawk is eating the viscera of a rodent. And that viscera is, is a, has a blue color to it. You can you all ought to be able to see that. And that blue color is intentional. It's the rodenticides. And they put this coloration kind of like a marker so that they can tell in fact that the rodent has died of rodenticide. And it's also one way that the autopsies can prove that they've got rodenticides in their body. So with this poor red tail hawk, unbeknownst to, to him or her, it's eating poison at the time this photograph was taken. Now from the exterminator's perspective, and again, this, this, this slide here is from Raptors Other Solution. You can get copies of this, kind of hard copies from them, or you can make them on your own. Um, and the reason these, these uh, exterminators like to use poisons is they like to come out and rebate that bait box. They like to just come out and rebate it and kind of you know get you as a recurring customer, a recurring cost, kind of like the cable guy. And they don't care to come out and reset traps and clear traps. They just assume that the rat take the poison, and what happens to it? They just want it to die afterwards. They don't really care where. Now, our concern, of course, is that the rat or the, the mouse will get outside and be eaten by an owl, as we've said. And that's our concern. It's not their concern. It just isn't. They don't feel the impact is that serious. 
I've talked to them or many that like the nine, the nine companies that, uh, that would, that refuse to go, you know, to, to take my account without using rodenticides, those nine, nine um, companies, you know, refused to it and they didn't think it was a big problem. Now, there's another reason why poisons are not such a great idea. And that is because not often, not, not all the time does the, the rodent die outside or get eaten by a, a hawk or an owl. It may die inside the house, it may die behind a wall. And you can only imagine the kind of odor that you might get and the, and the, the health hazard that's presented from rodents dying behind walls, be, dying behind the sheetrock in your house. So it's another reason not to use rod, rodenticide. And another, and also another, yet, yet another reason for not using them is they tend to attract the rodents. Okay, you're actually putting out bait to attract them. What you should be trying to do is get rid of the bait, get rid of the food sources, not putting out new food sources. So what are the things that you can do? Well, we have a house cat and that every year catches a couple of mice. I'm not sure how they get in, but they can get in. Um, you can you can use these snap traps. I have one here. I just snapped it. Maybe you saw it go up in the air. Um, they're instantaneous death typically. Um, they're certainly a lot better than poison. There are electric electronic traps like this radicator in the center screen, which you can find online. Basically, the mouse or the rodent will enter that radicator. It's powered by batteries with capacitors, and it basically electrocutes the rodent. There's live traps like seen in the lower right-hand corner and other uh, have a heart traps, which you can trap these rodents and re-release them somewhere else. There's dry ice pellets, which can be used to put in rodent burrows. You basically pack the dry ice in one end of the burrow and find any other entry or exit holes and, and pack them with dirt. The dry ice will evaporate, create carbon dioxide gas and will suffocate the rodent inside the burrow. Now there's a there's something here uh, on the middle right, and I've got a I've got one of these right here. I hope you can see that, okay? Uh, but th this is an ultrasonic repeller, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna plug it in here now, and hopefully you can see that a light light. This has an LED on the side to show that it's active. I don't know if you can see that. Um, now I can't hear anything. The the, the frequency you know, is advertised as being beyond my hearing range, but it's not beyond hearing range purportedly of the rodent and it tends to repel them. Now, do, how do I know it works? How do I know that's just not an LED in this little thing? I mean, I, I, I really don't. So what I do is I put this out with some simultaneous with, with the snap traps and with other repellers. And uh, I've noticed that the number of, uh, of tripped traps that I've found has gone way down when I've used one of these repellers. So I'm convinced they work, um, but I, I always have a backup plan and I also use the uh, snap traps. Now there's something in the middle here and it's called the A24 auto trap. Now this is a rather expensive device. Um, do I need to adjust my camera at all? Can you see that here? You can see that, good, okay. Um, basically what this is, is a, um, it's, a it's an automatic trap it's uh, self-setting, self-baiting, self-clearing rat trap, instantaneous kill. So uh, I hope this works because it did work two times before the presentation. I did test it out. I, re I changed, uh, there's a little uh, CO2 cylinder on the left-hand side here. You can see that in the screen. Um, that CO2 cylinder is what powers it. And next to the CO2 cylinder here is a, uh, a counter and it tells you how many times the trap has been tripped. And you can get up to 24 traps within one year of this rat trap. Now I'm gonna, if you see the little mouse that's coming along, that's coming, gonna enter the trap. So he's gonna go into the trap like this. Ooh, scares you. I mean, it, it, it hits it hard. It's an in instantaneous kill. And uh, it's it's rather amazing, amazing device. Um, if you wanna spend a few bucks and, uh, it, it handles all those things that you know the exterminator would want to hand, handle. It it does not poison the the rodent. The rodent falls away and can be scavenged by another rodent or another predator without itself being poisoned. Um, let me just I'll minimize the screen here if I 
I'm, he I'm hesitant to do that because uh, maybe at the end of the maybe at the end of the presentation we have time. I, I've got a video of this and this actually working, but right now I'll move on. Uh, there's of course many other kinds of traps. I don't like these traps because they're not sun sudden death. They drown the rodent, and that's not sudden death. I don't I don't like. I don't like, these are mammals after all. And I don't like, you know, uh, a cruel death for any mammal, no matter what it is. I'd like an instantaneous kill. Other, other options? Well, there's something called peppermint. I've never tried this. This is, this is a repellent now. You can put peppermint around and presumably this will repel the rodents from your house if you, if you spread it around the outside of your foundation. I use mothballs in my car that I store in a garage in the backyard. However, you gotta be worried about them because uh, if you have children, you know, they look like candy and you gotta be very careful with that. So it's, it's a bit dangerous from that perspective, but I'm cautious when I use it and I, I, I try to my best to be careful and I, I collect them you know, every year and I, I give the, uh, the children a lesson in rodenticide or you know, mothball safety. Uh, they do work. They do keep the, the rodents out of the car. There's a botanical repellent in the big middle here, which you can find online. I've not used that. I don't know how well it works. And some people say you can use bounce dryer sheets spread throughout a vehicle to keep the rodents out of the vehicle. And I've tried them and I actually found, I put some on the air cleaner of the car under the engine compartment. And there in the air cleaner on top of the bounce dryer sheet, was evidence that a chipmunk or a mouse had been eating acorns. So he was using it as like a picnic, uh, a, you know, a picnic uh, tablecloth. So they don't work. I would not use them anymore. And this over the lower left-hand corner, something called mouse balls. Now, you know, my, 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 when I, my wife heard I was ordering mouse balls. She wanted, she thought it was some sort of exotic delicacy like caviar or something. No, it's not that. These are is a little round plastic balls and they have, they have a repellent. I think it's largely made of mint and you can just toss these in your car. And I've used these last year and they seem to work quite well. You can, you can smell them and I haven't had a problem. Of course, I've, you know, I've got a belt and suspenders approach there. I've got multiple things working for me uh, to make sure that I don't have a rodent in the vehicle or in the boat because they can do a lot of damage. Just, I'm not denying that. They can do a lot of damage in a vehicle to, to upholstery and even wiring in your house. So you really, it's, it's really not tolerable. You got to get them out of the house. And there's this product here, which I've never used, but everything I've read about it indicates that it, that it works. It's a rodenticide, but it's not a rodenticide like an anticoagulant or a nervous system rodenticide that shuts off your brain function or the brain function of the rodent. Presumably it'll kill the rodent, but will not affect secondary predators. Presumably it, uh, it says here that it, it, its active ingredients coats the rat's stomach lining, blocking all messages sent from the stomach to the brain. This causes the rat to stop eating and drinking, leading to dehydration and eventual circulatory failure. So why doesn't it affect the, uh, the secondary non-target organism like the hawk that eats that rodent that's dying of this rat X? I'm not sure, but every testimonial I've read about it and articles I've seen in, in trade journals are very positive about it as you know, one of these solutions of people that like to set out a bait. But again, you're setting out a bait. Uh, I personally am unsure about it. I don't like using chemicals. I think someday they'll find out something that has gone wrong with it and is in fact is hurting the wildlife. So I won't, I won't use it anyways. And of course, also you tend to be attracting the rodents to your site because you're putting out bait. So, but it's, it's better than rodenticides. I will, you know, the anticoagulant rodenticides, I got to say that much for it. Now these, these things are terrible. These are absolutely hideous. These are glue traps. And I, I just think these should be banned immediately. You know, even for the, the mouse of the, the intended victim, they're sitting there stuck to this glue trap and it's a hideous way to dispatch them. There's a, there's a, a company by the name of Senestec. It's another chemical. They purport that it's a birth control for rodents that affects their uh, their um, their menstrual cycle, if you will, and causes them to be um, sterile for a period. And 
I've done some research on this and the city of Somerville has used it and they believe that it works. Um, again, better than rodenticides. They are an active contribut contributor to, to our cause. They donate to the Raptors of the Solution organization. In fact, they have sponsored one or more of those uh, roadside billboards. I'm a little bit concerned about it because again, it's a chemical. And it seems that we, whenever we introduce a new chemical, we don't find out about it really until several years or more later. So better than rodenticides, but not as good as, you know, the A4, A24 auto trap. But first, before you do any of those things, you know, clean up, clean up your act. Get, make sure that there are no food sources for the rodents. They had a big problem in Revere, Massachusetts with rodents. And they actually spent some close to a million dollars, $900,000 back in 2018, not that long ago, to provide rodent proof rubbish containers to all tax paying residents. And they were required to get them and required to use them. And if they didn't use them, they wouldn't pick up their track, they would, they would give them a citation. And they're convinced it's done a great deal to keep the rodents at bay. In other words, keeping, the, keeping them out of their food source. If they don't have food, they won't visit the area. All of these things can be part of any, any, uh, any exterminating company's uh, IPM, IPM's Integrated Pest Management Plan. And I kind of think I'm kind of doing that with my garage where I have multiples, multiple belt and suspenders approaches to control these rodents. That's my unwritten integrated management plan, integrated pest management plan. Here's yet another one here. I, I was just the other day. I was, I was over at a at a shop in West Boylston, and and a, and a cat's eye truck pulls in, and the cat's eye truck they advertise exclusion services. Well, they they'll guarantee to rodent proof your home. They go around the foundation at the sill, the foundation sill plates. These are the two by sixes, the two by fours, which are bolted to your foundation from which you know your stick built house is built upon. And they'll make sure that the rodents have no way to get in. I'm not exactly sure how they do that. I'm, I'm gonna get a quote from them because every year I get a couple of them. And sometimes they do, my cat's not always on the ball and they have, uh, they have caused some damage. So I'm gonna get a quote from them to see, see what exactly it costs to, to rodent proof my house. That's gonna be an, another action I'll be taking. Ultimately, the goal is, as in accordance with that website, Raptors are the solution. We're trying to get them to do their job. We're trying to get them to come to your neighborhood and do their job of eating the rodents. My neighbor said he has a, and he showed me, as a red shoulder hawk nest and a couple fledglings in the nest right across the street from me. And I, you know, in my yard, I've got, I've got tens of these uh, chipmunks, and I'm saying. Why aren't they, you know, put a sign out that go next door that there's plenty of chipmunks there. Now, I don't, I'm not really bothered by the chipmunks. They don't get into the house, so it doesn't really bother me. Some people are bothered by them because they dig holes in the lawn. I look at it as though they're aerating the lawn and they really don't bother me. And, it, and, and they're a food source for the raptors and I, I enjoy seeing the raptors. Because one red shouldered, one shouldered hawk, like the, the couple, one of the couple, next door to me can eat as many 30 of these uh, chipmunks a month. And you can avoid using decon and save yourself some money. Raptors, of course, especially the owls, will regurgitate the undigested food in something called a pellet. And you can tell what their diet has been and you can see that uh, most of the time it's small rodents. So they're the natural exterminators. Let's make use of them. You know, the biggest threat, the biggest threat to our wildlife is loss of open space. I just did a look at an updated look at this and Audubon says that we're losing in Massachusetts alone, 40 acres of open space every day in Massachusetts. And I think that's before the advent of solar fields, which are taking up a huge chunk of property. So we've got to coexist. If we're going to want to have wildlife around, we've got to learn to coexist with them. Kind of like this situation here in New Hampshire, where you know the the male tom comes out and blocks traffic for the for the hens to cross, and we on the road, you know, we'll stop and let them go. We have to coexist if we're going to have these raptors and these this fantastic um, variety of species here in Massachusetts that we see every day or we can see every day. Want to get them in your neighborhood? 
You can put up perches for them. You can put up owl boxes. Um, now we're not likely to get barn owls here in central Massachusetts, but I guess they're being they're being reintroduced or they're seeing some reintroduction with some frequency on Cape Cod and on the islands, but not too much so in the center of the state. Uh, those screech owls and barred, barred owls, like as shown in the center of the picture here, do use nest boxes. So if you want to put on a nest box together with a raptor perch, maybe you can invite a few of them to your yard and maybe they'll help take care of your rodents. So in summary, these rat poisons cause a lot of problems which we've talked about. They can become, the rodents can become resistant to the poisons. They destroy our predators and we don't really know the long-term effects relative to the raptors that don't get poisoned to the point of becoming a fatality. You know, what's happening to those partially poisoned raptors? How does that affect the, their, their resistance to other diseases and their ability to hunt and find rodents? And of course, we're talking about the apex predators here. And when you lose your apex predators, the other wildlife can, can become uncontrolled. Now this particular food web, web uh, diagram, also a, a uh, production of raptors of the solution, represents you know, both vertebrates and invertebrates and plants and other organisms. And there's not a single organism shown on this slide that hasn't, had, that hasn't been examined and found to have contained rodenticides, whether it's a slug or an earthworm, a robin, a mole or a great horned owl or a plant, they've all, at least there have been examples of all of them that have had rodenticides system, systemically in their tissues. But of course, as I just was mentioning, death is not the only consequence. You know, there's studies that show that it is, it is indeed infecting their ability to avoid, avoid predators. We are finding these anticoagulants in the ovaries of owls and and we're seeing birth defects in young owls as a result of these SGARs, SGARs, second generation anticoagulant rodenticides. Now, <clears throat> something that uh, was pointed out to me was this book by David Quammen called Spillover. And you know, the theme of which is that we are, we, you and I, the human population are tearing our ecosystems apart and we're co co -exist coexisting, as I've said, and animal, animals are, and humans are, are rubbing shoulders, if you will. Now, Lyme, everybody here, I'm certain, knows about Lyme disease. Many of you may have, have experienced, maybe living with it as we speak. I know I, I'm very concerned about it. Every year I get, on, on average, two embedded ticks, and I have to go through the process of sending the tick to UMass Stockbridge School to see if it has any diseases while I simultaneously take uh, a uh, antibiotic. But the myth is that the, um, the ticks are spread by the white-tailed deer, when in fact, this uh, author alleges that's false. They're, in they're spread, in fact, by the white-footed mouse, shown here in the beak of this barred owl. That's the main predator of this nocturnal animal, is the barred owl. And uh, we're eliminating these barred owls, then, we're, then these um, white-footed mice, mice are going to proliferate, and they're going to spread more Lyme disease. And anybody knows that Lyme disease is a, is a hideous disease should you catch it. And um, so let's do what we can to let the barred owls take care of these mice so we don't get infected with these ticks. So what can you do? You was, we've talked about some of these things already, but you know, I'm on the Board of Health. Can you partner with your Board of Health? Maybe, you're a board, maybe one or more of you are our Board of Health members. You can promote proactive measures discussed that we've discussed this far. You can use the authority of the Board of Health to make sure your dumpsters in town and garbage areas are kept clean. You can sponsor a warrant article actually banning rodenticides in your town. Now people will say, you can't do it, that's against state law. But the town of Warwick, Massachusetts has successfully banned glyphosates, which is the, the, the herbicide Roundup in their town. And it hasn't yet been challenged. And to my knowledge, nobody's using glyphosates in their town. You can consider nominating local businesses for the Raptors Are the Solution Owl Wise Leader Program. And this gives any particular business or 
condo complex or store or restaurant kind of a, a kudos, an acknowledgement that they've, they've decided to go poison free and you can advertise it in your local paper. You're giving them a pat on the back. Um, and you know, we like to go to environmentally sensitive organizations. That's an attractive marketing tool um, to, to, to attract customers. And anybody that's on the Board of Health, you don't, you don't get rid of your rights as a citizen just because you're on a Board of Health. However, my Board of Health is, is a little bit more conserv conservative than I'd like. And be re get ready for a contest because I've had contests with my fellow cohorts. Now, these all wise leaders, as I've said, they're a pat on the back for any business, any condo complex, any school, any public building, any library that decides to go poison free. Now, in the time I've been involved with this since 2018, I've been, I've been party to uh, three of these awards, uh, two in, in Arlington, Massachusetts, and one in New Haven, Connecticut. This is an example of what we do and we, we publish this. This happens to be the Butternut Bakery in Arlington. And there we have the uh, store owner to the right. We have me on the left and we have one of the uh, proponents of, of our, our mission in the center that actually uses this great horned owl um, if you will, as a bit of a, uh, a prop, which really attracts people. When you put that owl and you, know, you hold that owl in your hand, people that otherwise would walk by and hardly notice our poster, they'll stop and take notice and you get a chance to get their ear. So we've done this at both locations, or both in New Haven, Connecticut and here in Arlington. As I, as I said, my personal, my personal bar for success my limbo bar for success is to just convince one of you to spread the word and get one of you to stop using these poisons or one of the people that you spread the word to. Because right now, as you'll see with, with Bill HT4206, awareness is the only tool that's being approached. Now, something happened here very recently. There was a stud, couple studies which were put out which was showing that these rodenticides were showing up in our largest of all raptors, the golden and bald eagles, our national sim symbol, in huge numbers. And people started to take notice. And uh, coincidentally, about the same time, just a few weeks ago, the first documented case, notwithstanding the case I talked about earlier in the show, of a bald eagle that was poisoned in Waltham, Massachusetts, and it got a lot of attention. People, you know, finally we're taking notice. My God, we're killing our national symbol here. You know, a nesting bald eagle on on the uh, on the river on the Con on the Charles River in Waltham of all places, killing this female bald eagle, which you know it it's it's appalling. And it got a lot of attention, and it got so much attention that this bill by Senator uh, Representative Hawkins was prepared HT four oh six. Again, you know, one of you, many of you might look at this and say, what is it really doing? It's providing awareness. So what is it, how is it providing awareness? It's saying that anytime an exterminator uses these anticoagulants at any location, they have to get the customer signatory recognizing the hazard that they're taking part in, that, if, that effectively you could be taking part in the killing of these these magnificent raptors, and you're you're becoming signatory to that fact, and that's believed that that type of awareness initiative will in fact discourage people from using rodenticides, as I have found when I've presented this to individuals that were regular rodenticide users that decided after becoming aware of this problem decided to not use them. That's basically the just the meat of the bill is right there. And you know it's it's a baby step. I tend to look at it as a big step because it gets this be front and center, and it allows us to take second steps subsequent to this. There's a huge exterminator lobby out there, and they've got lots of money that they want to keep using these rodenticides, and they make make very make a lot of noise, if you will, spend a lot of money fighting these sort of bills. So again. We're right now in the process of having weekly conference calls on how to st strategize 
for getting this bill passed, looking for co-sponsors. And the next page I have a bunch of co-sponsors. If you don't see your representative on this list, and it, it, unfortunately this list is not complete because it was cut off at the bottom, go just Google HD 4206, um, Representative James Hawkins, and you'll see all the legislators that have signed on to this, in addition to the organizations at the top of the screen. If your representative is not on there, urge your representative to get on there. If your representative is on there, congratulate him, congratulate him and tell him that he'll have your vote, him or her. Okay, um, it's a few more slides to go. I thought this was a prophetic statement that was in this National Geographic uh, edition de de devoted to the year 2018 to the year of the birds. If you take care of the birds, you take care of most of the problems of the world. So if, that, if, if we need some motivation, that's pretty motivating. Again, what have we learned since uh, Rachel Carson? I thought this was taken care of, you know, back when I found that great horned owl back in 1960, back, you know, about that time when, when DDT was a big issue and Rachel Carson had, had uh, written Silent Spring, but it's not gone away. We're still killing these, these magnificent snowy owls and bald eagles. And I want them to be around when my granddaughters and great granddaughters will be around to look at these and, and enjoy them. As I said, they, uh, they not only help the environment, they help our souls. Now, one thing I did just prior to the, uh, the issue of the bald eagle that was, was, uh, was, was killed in Waltham by rodenticides is I started one of these uh, change.org petitions, just almost on a lark. You know, I was getting an advertisement on, on Facebook to start one of these things. I said, what the heck, I'll try it. So I, uh, wrote up a petition to Governor Charlie Baker. And uh, son of a gun, I got some 6,700 people signed on it. And there was like 57,000 views, 851 shares. As I said, over 6,000 signatures. Awareness, people are becoming aware. Okay, I, I'll take uh, questions from you if you have any questions. Uh, Thank you. That was so great, Gary. Thank you so much. I do have a couple of questions. So just as a reminder, if you guys have questions, if you would tap, tap them, sorry, tap them, type them in the chat function, I will relay them. Um, let's see. So um, one question is, do we know yet if the pest repeller is detectable and possibly an irritant to pets like cats and dogs? And is this a concern? That's a very good question. I'm told by the advertisers that it's not, but I don't understand that. I don't understand how that can be. So I only use those ultrasonic pest repellers in my outbuilding for that very reason. Notwithstanding that when I've investigated this, they assure me that it doesn't affect the dogs or the cats. Uh, quite frankly, I don't trust that. And so I only use it in my outbuildings, just like, you know, contrapest. They say it doesn't affect the secondary non-target organisms, but it's a chemical. And I'm concerned that if it can affect the reproduction of the rodent, that it will re affect the reproduction of the raptor sometime in the distant future or not so distant future. The same with rat X. They assure me that it's not an issue, but I will not use them for that concern. Is the band one pound of bait or one pound of active ingredient? one pound of bait. In other words, when I, when I uh, got that box of, uh, or that bag of the Brodificum, the second, generator, second generation anticoagulant from Amazon, that was an eight pound bag. The amount of the active ingredient that, of course it's mixed with neutral products, just like any, most any kind of, uh, you know, whether it's bleach in your home and your, in your bleach bottle, you know, most of that is, is a carrier. So no, it's, it's the entire product, including the, uh, the active ingredient. However, mm -hmm. that, however, that rodent, rodenticide manufacturer chooses to formulate their mix. It's eight pounds of that mix or one pound of that mix. 
Aside from raptors, what other species are declining due to rodenticides? Well, um, in Massachusetts, you know, has anybody ever seen a bobcat? I don't Not know. Cape Cod. <laughs> a lot of people. Well, you know, I've, I've hardly seen any bobcats in my life. I think I've seen two. And, you know, bobcats, they're not a big animal. They're not much bigger than a house cat. Their primarily prey is rodents. And so how do we know that they're being killed by rodenticides? We don't really know that. Um, we do know that they, they can be. We do know that foxes that have been autopsied have evidence of rodenticides. But just about any animal that... Uh, you know, will be attracted to a bait box like a skunk, a raccoon, a fox, a mink, a weasel, mm. a fisher. Any, any one of these two animals, it, it can be affected by these rodenticides. No, but to answer your question, I do not have data to show that rodenticides are seriously impacting those populations. But why risk it? Indeed. Um, I did want to share that your slide about using deterrents. I have personally used peppermint um, oil at my home. Um, I use it to deter bugs too, but I was able to move mice out of my grill that they had moved into and from a spot underneath my deck successfully just with using the um, organic peppermint oil. So Pretty good. I don't know if it's because I scared them and they <laughs> moved out. We're going to move out anyway, but it did successfully work for me and they haven't come back. I Excellent. spray it every once in a while and they haven't come back. So for anyone that's curious, um, I live in the woods on Cape Cod and it I have used a couple of deterrents. I also ordered something called Grandpa Gus's that I'm going to give a try as well. Yes, I've seen that advertised pretty heavily on, on Facebook. Yeah, I haven't um, tried it yet, but I'm going to be interested. So I'll add comment to this after we finish if it comes in it and it's successful. Great. So let's see. Um, someone said, oh, there's lots of data from California that shows that cougars have died from rodenticide. That's very true. Um, so let's see. I, someone I asked if snap traps are cruel. They can be. If the rodent doesn't get doesn't get hit, basically in the neck, uh, they can be cruel. But they're um, less cruel than poisoning, I would say. So you know, someone did, wrote. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I did. It's always there's always a give and a take in this. This is never a typically never the the, the greatest solution. I think the great, one of the best solution, of course, is, is deterrence, repellents, keep them out of your area, keep them in, in outside your house where they can be food for the raptors, which is what we want ultimately. So, you know, the ideal solution is to keep them out of your house, to yes. make sure they don't have food sources, rodent proof your house, like I'm gonna attempt to do with this, this organization that guarantees it. Those are the best solutions. And they pretty much handle those kind of questions. We do have some suggestions on our website as well. If, if anyone's looking for some um, solution, some organic solutions, um, Stephanie put together a list a while ago. And I'm also gonna share, um, we did a talk a few weeks ago with Laura Kelly and she shared a few um, specifically Cape Cod companies that offer um, solutions like the companies that you referenced, Gary. Good. Um, I have a person saying that I'm concerned about the, Sonic repeller for my granddaughters. They have guinea pigs. I've heard they can't use it because it might affect their pets. Any opinion on that? Well, you know, it seems logical that they would because, you know, a guinea pig is a rodent. It's not a large rodent. And it would seem, it would seem to me that notwithstanding, you know, that it, I think when, when you ask about pets um, for these ultrasonic repellers, what I've been told, it does not affect your pet. They're thinking of cats and dogs. They're not thinking of guinea pigs but they've got to affect guinea pigs. They've got to be irritating to them because that's the whole reason they operate is to be irritating to the rodents to keep them out of the building. Right, <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> um, let's see, someone has written in that they were told not to feed birds because it, the food will attract rats. That is that is true. I mean, if you've got rats and you've got, you've got a bird feeder, you've got a food source for them, they're being attracted to that. 
Now I have chipmunks here and I have a bird feeder and the chipmunks do eat the, the bird seed, but it doesn't bother me. They're outside, they stay outside. And if they wanna eat a little bird food, it doesn't bother me. You know, I'll do things like grease the pole with, with, uh, with Crisco. And then the, the, it's, really, it's really rather entertaining to watch the chipmunk or the squirrel climb up the pole and grab on it and start sliding down with all four feet grabbing the pole, wondering why he can't get a grip. <laughs> um, it is it's rather entertaining. But it doesn't hurt him. Then he licks, he stops and he licks his paws and he goes, he gets the seed that's on the ground. Agreed. Same here. And I tend to keep my feeders far away from the house. Um, I don't know if that helps anyone. They, you know, if you can put feeders a little bit further away and then do deterrents around under your deck, um, like the peppermint spray, that might actually give you a nice balance. Well, here in, here in Sterling, we have, we, our, our, property is frequented by black bears. And Ooh. so I'm concerned about attracting black bears to the neighborhood. Um, I've never encountered one personally, but I know they've been in my yard. Um, I, I just know they've been in the yard. I can get into specifics, but they've been here. And I don't really want to run into one, you know? So, you know, when, when, when the winter's over and I believe they're, they're out of hibernation, I take the bird feeders down. Not for the mice or the chipmunks. I take it down because I don't want black bears coming here. That's that's a legitimate concern. <laughs> um, let's see. Karen has a question. Have she, a few people have written that this is an excellent talk, and thank you. So I wanted to pass that on. Well, you're all very uh, welcome. And if you know of any other venues or you'd like to to get a copy of this presentation, I can I can put it on a Google Drive, and you're welcome to use it as you uh, as you see fit. Again trying to spread the word. And don't forget to write to your representatives, everyone. Exactly. Um, let's see, Karen's question is, have you interacted with or presented to departments of public health, restaurants associations, pest control companies, or other entities that could possibly be possibly influenced by your ideas and expertise? I've presented to my own board of health, but I've not presented to any other organization like you've mentioned. The types of organizations that I've mentioned, you know, are like I've said, the Audubon societies, um, Eastern Hawk Watch, groups like that. I presented to um, social, excuse me, social groups like Lions Clubs, those type of groups, and uh, library groups, um, um, garden clubs, senior centers, things like that. But yeah, if you know of any, if anybody knows anybody that would like a presentation and, and, and they'd like to refer them to me, I'd be happy to do that. I, I will travel pretty much anywhere throughout the state. And uh, actually I did, I did do a presentation in Provincetown long, a year ago, just prior to COVID mm. um, at their library and it was for their board of health. Um, let's see. Um, I see a few people writing in, they're saying thank you. And it was wonderful. Katie, I shared Gary's email at the beginning of the chat. So if you scroll up there, um, you can, you should be able to copy and paste it. Um, so if you email him, he can provide you with a copy of this presentation to present to your homeowners association. And I don't charge anything and I don't charge expenses or anything, you know, within the state or, you know, within a within a hundred mile radius of my home. <laughs> Anytime you can vacation on the Cape, we'd love to have you. Okay. So I think that's all of the questions and we are at about 8.15. So this is a great time to wrap it up. Gary, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Well, you're very welcome. This, this was incredibly it. informative. I'm glad everyone really enjoyed it. I learned a lot even from the last time. So I think this was truly wonderful. We did record this. So if you want to rewatch this again, or you have questions that you may need answered, this will be on our YouTube. Um, usually I post it two or three days after the presentation. So you'll be able to watch this again, along with some of our other chats that we've done recently. Um, with some other organic solutions on how to live um, a little bit more of a cleaner life and help our wild neighbors stay safe and healthy. I did want to mention that on June 9th, so every Wednesday we've been doing these wonderful Wild Wednesday 
uh, virtual chats. We have a few more coming up, but um, Gary did bring up ContraPest a couple of times, and we did speak to a representative from there who is willing to do a Q&A with us on June 9th so that we can get a little bit more information. So Gary, if you'd like to join us for that as a participant, we'd love to have you. I'm sure you have some great questions. Yeah, I'm, I've been, as I say, I've been assured by the folks that you know, that have developed these techniques that they're totally safe for second generation, but I still, it's hard to convince me that a chemical is not somehow going to have an effect on a, on a secondary non-target organism. You know. Well, we are going to do a little bit of extra research and hear what they have to say so that everyone can make their own determination. I'm a little bit curious just about the process. I don't know that I'll end up using it myself, but um, I am a little curious how it fits into all of this. But definitely everyone join us next Wednesday. We are doing Reducing Your Plastics in the Environment with Jess. Um, she's a local, she owns Green Road Refill. And the Wednesday after that is Life in an Egg, which sort of partners very well with some of the things that Gary talked about tonight. Stephanie will be presenting that, the life, si life cycle of eggs, um, a lot of the native species here on the Cape, but she will be talking about raptors and touching on um, DDT and what that did to eggs. Um, years ago when, you know, they were just crumpling in the nest. So that's always an interesting presentation. If you want to sign up for that one, that information is on our Facebook and on our Eventbrite. As always, thank you, Gary, for being with us. Thank you everyone for attending. We really, really appreciate it. This was crazy great. Please sign the petition right to your, I'm not really supposed to do anything political, but if you would like to, no pressure, please write to your representatives um, and call your town officials. It's, um, you know, every phone call actually does matter, just like every $5 matters to us. It is baby season at Wild Care, just as a reminder. So you can always shop our wish list. You can donate through Facebook, donate on our website. And thank you so, so much for supporting us. And we will see you next Wild Wednesday. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.